hadn't planned to spend the day trudging through the dense Appalachian forest, but duty calls. My name's Evan Dermott, and I work for a specialized missing persons unit. We deal with cases most people would rather ignore, the ones that defy easy explanations. We were dispatched to a small town in West Virginia. Two hikers had gone missing in the Blue Ridge Mountains. The local authorities were stumped, so they called us in. My partner, Lydia Fain, a no-nonsense woman with a knack for tracking, joined me. We drove our old, beat-up SUV up a winding dirt road, the trees forming a green tunnel around us. We parked at the trailhead and geared up. This place gives me the creeps, Lydia said, adjusting her pack. Let's find these people and get out of here. We started down the trail, the morning sun filtering through the leaves, casting dappled shadows on the ground. The first couple of miles were easy, just a gentle incline and well-trodden path. But as we got deeper, the trail became less defined. The trees grew closer together, their branches intertwining above us. I can see why people get lost out here, I said. Easy to lose your bearings. Lydia nodded. Stay sharp, Evan. This isn't your usual missing person case. The deeper we went, the more unsettling it became. The forest was unnaturally silent. No birds chirping, no rustle of small animals, just the sound of our footsteps and the occasional snap of a twig. We found the hikers' campsite a few hours later. It looked like they had left in a hurry. Their tent was still pitched, backpacks and supplies scattered around. Looks like they ran from something, Lydia observed. Or someone, I added. We started searching the area for any signs of struggle or tracks that might tell us where they went. That's when we found the first body. It was a man, his face frozen in a mask of terror, eyes wide open staring at nothing. His throat had been torn out, blood soaked into the ground around him. Jesus, I muttered. What the hell did this? Lydia knelt beside the body, examining the wounds. No animal I've ever seen. These aren't claw marks. More like... teeth. We called it in and continued searching, more cautiously now. The sense of being watched was almost palpable. The second body was a few hundred yards from the first. A woman this time. Her death had been just as brutal. Something had ripped her apart. We need to find out what did this, Lydia said, her voice tense. Agreed, but let's be smart about it. Whatever did this could still be out here. We followed a trail of blood deeper into the forest, moving slowly, weapons drawn. The trees seemed to close in around us, the air growing colder and the light dimmer. The blood trail led us to a cave entrance, hidden behind thick underbrush. You ready for this? I asked Lydia. She nodded her face set in grim determination. Let's go. We entered the cave, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. The air was damp and musty, the walls covered in strange, claw-like marks. As we moved deeper, the cave opened up into a large chamber. That's when we saw it. The creature was unlike anything I had ever seen. It stood on two legs, its body covered in matted fur. It had a hunched back, long arms ending in razor-sharp claws. But the most horrifying part was its face, a grotesque mixture of animal and human, with a wide, grinning mouth full of jagged teeth. It was feasting on the remains of one of the hikers. As our flashlight beams hit it, it turned and let out a guttural snarl. Shoot it! I yelled, raising my gun. Lydia and I fired, but the creature moved with inhuman speed, dodging our bullets and disappearing into the darkness. After it, Lydia shouted, and we gave chase. The tunnel twisted and turned, our footsteps echoing off the walls. We could hear the creature ahead, its heavy breathing, and the occasional scrape of claws against stone. The chase seemed endless, our lungs burning, hearts pounding. Suddenly the tunnel opened up into another chamber, and the creature was waiting. It lunged at us with terrifying speed, and I barely managed to dodge its swipe. Lydia wasn't as lucky. The creature's claws raked across her arm, drawing blood. I fired again, this time hitting it in the shoulder. 
It let out a scream of rage and pain but kept coming. Desperate, I grabbed a flare from my pack and lit it, thrusting it towards the creature. The bright light and heat made it recoil, snarling in fury. Get back! I shouted, waving the flare. The creature hesitated, then turned and fled down another tunnel. Are you okay? I asked Lydia, who was clutching her bleeding arm. I'll live, she gritted out. We can't let it get away. We continued our pursuit, but the creature was too fast. It disappeared into the labyrinthine tunnels, leaving us in the darkness. We need to get out of here, Lydia said. Regroup and come back with more firepower. Reluctantly, I agreed. We retraced our steps, making our way back to the surface. As we emerged into the fading daylight, I radioed for backup. While we waited, we treated Lydia's wound and tried to make sense of what we had seen. What the hell was that thing? Lydia asked, her voice trembling slightly for the first time. I don't know, I admitted. But it's dangerous. And we need to stop it. Our backup arrived shortly after. A team of heavily armed agents and a couple of local law enforcement officers. We briefed them on what we had encountered, and they looked at us with a mixture of disbelief and horror. Are you sure about this? One of the officers, a man named Tanner, asked. This sounds like something out of a nightmare. We're sure, Lydia said firmly. And we're going back in. With our reinforcements, we descended into the cave again. This time, we were better prepared. We moved methodically, clearing each tunnel and chamber, searching for any sign of the creature. We found its lair in the deepest part of the cave. It was a grotesque scene. Bones and half-eaten corpses scattered around, the air thick with the stench of decay. And there, in the center, was the creature. It looked weaker, its movement sluggish, likely from the wound I had inflicted earlier. Surround it, Tanner shouted, and we moved to encircle the creature. It let out a roar of defiance and charged at us. Gunfire erupted, the sound deafening in the confined space. The creature's body jerked and spasmed as bullets tore into it. Finally, it collapsed to the ground, its eyes still filled with rage and defiance. We cautiously approached, making sure it was truly dead. Tanner prodded it with his boot. What the hell is this thing? Doesn't matter, I said. It's over. We got it. We gathered evidence, took photos, and documented everything. The bodies of the missing hikers were recovered, their families finally given some closure, though it was a grim one. Back at our makeshift command center, Lydia and I debriefed our superiors. They listened, their faces grim. You did well, our boss said. This thing won't be hurting anyone else. But the question of what it was and where it came from remained unanswered. The forest was safe again, but the memory of what we had encountered lingered. That night, as we packed up our gear and prepared to leave, I couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't over. There were always more mysteries, more unexplained disappearances, and as long as there were, we would be there ready to face whatever came next. We drove back down the mountain, the forest receding behind us. The road stretched out ahead, leading us to our next case, our next encounter with the unknown. The air was thick with the scent of pine and the soft hum of insects as I stepped out of my truck. The remote stretch of woods in upstate New York had always been a place of mystery and quiet, the kind of place where you could lose yourself and forget the world. As a field agent for the missing persons unit, I had seen more than my fair share of bizarre disappearances, but this one had a particularly eerie feel to it. My name is Reuben Caldwell, and I've been tracking down missing persons for over a decade. This case brought me to the fringes of the Adirondack Park, a place teeming with dense forests and a labyrinth of trails that seemed to lead to nowhere. Two hikers, Simon Kellerman and Iris Jones, had vanished without a trace three days ago. Their car was found at a trailhead, their camping gear inside but no sign of them. It was a pattern I was all too familiar with. 
people go missing, no clues left behind, and the wilderness swallows them whole. I parked near the ranger station, where a grizzled old man named Hank Reed was waiting for me. He was the kind of guy you'd expect to find in these parts, tall, wiry, with a face weathered by years of sun and wind. He offered a firm handshake and a knowing nod. Agent Caldwell, I presume? He asked, his voice gravelly. That's right. Any updates since we last spoke? I replied, trying to hide my fatigue. It had been a long drive and I was eager to get started. Not much. Search teams have combed through the usual areas. It's like they just vanished, he said, scratching his chin thoughtfully. But there's something you should know. Locals talk about strange sightings in these woods. Creatures, they say. Not your usual wildlife. I raised an eyebrow. Creatures? What kind of creatures? Hank shrugged. Depends who you ask. Some say they've seen figures moving in the trees at night. Others talk about hearing noises. Strange ones like nothing you'd hear from an animal around here. Great, I thought. Local legends and ghost stories, just what I needed. But Hank seemed earnest and I wasn't about to dismiss anything that could help. We set off on one of the trails, the late afternoon sun casting long shadows through the canopy. Hank led the way, his rifle slung over his shoulder. I had my own sidearm, a Glock 19, just in case. As we walked, the forest seemed to close in around us, the trees growing denser and the underbrush thicker. The usual sounds of the forest, birds, rustling leaves, the distant trickle of a stream, were there. But beneath it all there was an unsettling quiet, like the woods were holding their breath. We reached the campsite where Simon and Iris were last seen. Their tent was still there, untouched. A cold campfire pit lay in the center, surrounded by scattered belongings. I crouched down, examining the ground for any clues, footprints, dropped items, anything. Nothing looks disturbed, I noted, frustration creeping into my voice. Hank nodded. It's like they just got up and walked away. I continued to search the area, moving slowly and methodically. Something glinted in the dirt near the edge of the campsite. I picked it up, a small, tarnished locket. It looked old, but not ancient, and had a tiny photograph inside. A young woman with a shy smile. I showed it to Hank. Recognize this? He shook his head. Never seen it before. Might belong to one of the hikers. I pocketed the locket, intending to check it against any personal effects we had on file for Simon and Iris. We decided to split up to cover more ground, agreeing to meet back at the campsite before dark. As I ventured deeper into the forest, the sense of unease grew stronger. The trees seemed to whisper secrets, their branches forming twisted skeletal fingers that reached out like they wanted to grab me. I pushed through the underbrush, keeping my eyes peeled for anything out of the ordinary. Then I heard it, a faint, almost imperceptible rustling. I stopped, holding my breath, straining to hear. The sound came again, closer this time. It wasn't the wind or an animal. It was deliberate, like someone or something was moving just out of sight. I drew my Glock, holding it steady as I edged forward. The rustling grew louder and then I saw it, a flash of movement among the trees. I took a step closer, my heart pounding. The figure moved again and I caught a glimpse of something not human. It was tall, with long limbs and a hunched posture. Its skin was a mottled gray, blending seamlessly with the bark and shadows. What the hell? I muttered, raising my gun. The creature turned its head, and for a brief moment, our eyes met. There was intelligence there, something almost calculating. And then it was gone, melting back into the forest with a speed and silence that was unnerving. I stood there, frozen, trying to process what I had seen. I'd dealt with all sorts of weird cases, but this was something entirely different. I had to find Hank, tell him what I saw. I turned back, moving quickly now, my senses on high alert. I reached the campsite, but Hank was nowhere to be seen. I called out his name, my voice echoing through the trees. No response. 
Anxiety clawed at my gut. I checked my watch, almost dusk. The shadows were lengthening and the forest was growing darker by the minute. I paced the campsite, my mind racing. Where could he have gone? I took out my radio, trying to contact him. Hank, this is Caldwell. Do you copy? Static. I tried again, but there was no answer. I cursed under my breath. This was not good. Not good at all. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream pierced the air, cutting through the silence like a knife. It was Hank. Without thinking, I ran towards the sound, my gun drawn. The scream came again, followed by a series of guttural growls. My heart pounded as I crashed through the underbrush, branches scratching at my face and arms. I burst into a small clearing, and what I saw made my blood run cold. Hank was on the ground, his body twisted at an unnatural angle. Standing over him was the creature, its elongated limbs and razor-sharp claws covered in blood. It looked up as I entered the clearing, its eyes reflecting a malevolent intelligence. Get away from him, I shouted, firing a shot. The creature moved with impossible speed, dodging the bullet and disappearing into the forest. I rushed to Hank's side, but it was too late. His lifeless eyes stared up at the sky, his throat torn open. Damn it, Hank, I whispered, fighting back the rising panic. I had to get out of there, get help and figure out what the hell was happening in these woods. I radioed for backup, giving them my coordinates and a brief description of what had happened. Then I started back towards the ranger station, moving as fast as I could while keeping an eye on my surroundings. The forest was alive with shadows, and every rustle of leaves made my heart jump. I stumbled onto the main trail just as the sun dipped below the horizon. The ranger station was a small beacon of light in the gathering darkness. I burst through the door, startling the young ranger on duty. Agent Caldwell, what's going on? She asked, eyes wide with fear. We need to get out of here now, I said, my voice hoarse. There's something in the woods. It killed Hank. Her face went pale, but she didn't argue. We grabbed what we could and made a hasty retreat to my truck. As we drove away the headlights cutting through the darkness, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. Back at the main office, I filed my report and handed over the locket. The investigation would continue, but I had a sinking feeling we wouldn't find Simon and Iris, or whatever was responsible for the disappearances. The next day, a team was dispatched to the area, heavily armed and ready for anything. They found Hank's body just as I had left it, but there was no sign of the creature. The locals continued to whisper about the strange happenings in the woods, but no one dared venture too far. In the end, the case of the missing hikers remained unsolved, a chilling reminder of the things that lurk in the dark corners of our world. And though I tried to put it behind me, I knew I'd never forget the sight of those eyes, staring back at me from the shadows. You think you've seen it all until you haven't. It was a routine Thursday at the missing persons unit. Nothing out of the ordinary. Just another day of tracking down the vanished. My name's Hank Driscoll, and I've been at this gig for over a decade. I've seen the darkest corners of humanity, and yet today was about to show me something I couldn't even begin to fathom. Our office, a nondescript building in the middle of downtown Providence, Rhode Island, was a far cry from the scenic coastal views the city boasted. It was more the type of place you'd find in a noir film, dimly lit, with creaky floorboards and the faint smell of old coffee. The atmosphere was thick with the weight of unanswered questions and the lingering dread of the unknown. I was sifting through a stack of files on my desk when my partner, Billy Carraway, barged in, his face pale and eyes wide. Hank, you need to see this, he said, thrusting a thin brown folder into my hands. Billy was a young kid, fresh out of the academy. He had a sharp mind, but he hadn't yet developed the tough skin you need for this line of work. I opened the folder to find the details of a new case. Abigail Thornton, a 22-year-old college student who had gone missing from her dorm room three days ago. 
No signs of forced entry, no witnesses, just gone. Her parents have been calling every hour, Billy added, running a hand through his hair. They swear she wouldn't just leave without a word. I nodded, flipping through the pages. Abigail's photo stared back at me, a bright-eyed girl with a future ahead of her. We needed to move fast. All right, let's start with her dorm, I said, grabbing my coat. The drive to Abigail's college was uneventful, the summer sun glaring down on us as we navigated through the midday traffic. The campus was alive with students, completely oblivious to the dark turn one of their own had taken. Her dorm was a typical student housing complex, brick walls covered in ivy, and a quiet sense of normalcy that belied the turmoil inside. We met with Abigail's roommate, Jessica, a petite girl with red hair and a nervous disposition. She told us about the night Abigail disappeared. She was here one minute, and the next she was gone. I thought maybe she went to the library, but she never came back. Her room was tidy, almost unnaturally so for a college student. Nothing seemed out of place, except for a single notebook on her desk, open to a page filled with frantic scribbles. I picked it up, reading aloud, they're coming. I can feel them watching. I don't know how much time I have left. Billy and I exchanged glances. Looks like we've got more than just a missing person, I muttered. Back at the office, we dug deeper into Abigail's life. She was a psychology major, top of her class, with no known enemies or personal issues. Her friends described her as cheerful and driven, with a keen interest in the paranormal. A search through her laptop revealed forums and chat rooms where she discussed urban legends and supernatural phenomena. That night, we decided to follow up on one of the leads from her notes, a mention of The Watchers, an obscure group that supposedly tracked and observed individuals who delved too deeply into forbidden knowledge. It sounded like the kind of stuff you'd find in a bad horror flick, but I'd learned long ago not to dismiss anything outright. The next morning, we received an anonymous tip. A shaky voice on the other end of the line directed us to an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of the city. She's there, the caller whispered before the line went dead. Billy and I drove out to the warehouse, a decrepit structure that looked like it hadn't been used in decades. The air inside was thick with dust and the smell of mildew. We moved cautiously, flashlights cutting through the darkness. We found Abigail in a small, windowless room tied to a chair, eyes wide with terror. Hank, is that you? She whispered, her voice hoarse. We're here, Abigail. You're safe now, I said, cutting her loose. She shook her head frantically. No, you don't understand. They're here. They're coming. Before we could ask who she meant, a loud crash echoed through the warehouse. We spun around to see shadows moving in the darkness, shapes that defied logic and reason. They were not human, not entirely. Twisted forms with elongated limbs and faces devoid of features. Billy and I drew our guns, but the bullets seemed to pass through the creatures without any effect. We were forced to retreat, dragging Abigail with us. As we stumbled back into the daylight, the creatures halted, retreating into the shadows. It was as if they were bound to the darkness. Back at the station, we questioned Abigail, but her story was fragmented, filled with half-remembered details and an overwhelming sense of fear. She spoke of rituals and ancient rites, of beings that existed beyond our understanding. The evidence we gathered was enough to ensure her safety, but it left more questions than answers. The case was officially closed, but unofficially, it haunted us. We had glimpsed something beyond the veil of reality, something that defied all logical explanation. Billy and I continued our work, but the memory of that day lingered. We kept tabs on Abigail, making sure she was safe. The creatures never returned, but their presence was a shadow over our lives, a reminder that some mysteries are better left unsolved. And in the quiet moments, when the world seemed normal, 
I couldn't help but wonder if they were still out there, watching, waiting. The final act of that encounter played out as I reviewed the case files one last time. Abigail had moved to another city, changed her name, and started a new life. The creatures, whatever they were, seemed content to let her be. Or maybe they had found another target. The world kept turning, and we kept searching for the missing, always aware that some cases would never truly be solved. The city's pulse continued, oblivious to the hidden horrors lurking in its shadows. But for those of us who knew, the knowledge was a burden we bore in silence, a reminder that sometimes the truth is stranger and more terrifying than we can imagine. I left the office that night, the weight of the case pressing down on me. Billy gave me a nod, a silent acknowledgement of what we'd faced. We'd continue our work, knowing that out there in the darkness, things existed beyond our understanding, things that waited for the right moment to emerge. As I walked to my car, the city lights flickering in the distance, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. I paused, looking back at the office one last time. Maybe, just maybe, we had seen a glimpse of a larger truth, one that was best left buried in the shadows. Without a word, I got into my car and drove away, leaving the darkness behind, but never truly escaping it. The streets were quiet, the city asleep, unaware of the unseen watchers that lingered just beyond the edge of our reality. In the end, all we could do was keep going, one day at a time, knowing that some mysteries were meant to remain unsolved, some truths best left undiscovered. You wouldn't believe the crazy day I had at work. I'm not one to complain much, but when you work for a missing persons unit, you tend to see some weird stuff. I've been with the agency for about 10 years now. My name's Dane Mickelson, and let me tell you, nothing could have prepared me for what went down today. We got a call early in the morning. The sun was barely up, and I was still nursing my first cup of coffee. The call was from a frantic mother in Tupper Lake, New York. Her teenage son, Ethan, had gone missing during a late-night walk. Normally, we'd leave cases like this to the local police, but something about the call, the desperation in her voice, made me grab my coat and head out. Tupper Lake isn't too far from where our unit is based, but it's remote enough to make you feel like you've stepped back in time. The town's got that small-town charm, with a main street lined with mom-and-pop shops and old Victorian houses the kind of place where everyone knows everyone else's business. As I drove into town, I couldn't help but feel a chill run down my back. There was something off about this place, and I couldn't put my finger on it. I met with Ethan's mother, Mrs. O'Hara, at her home. She was a mess. Eyes red from crying, hair all over the place. She told me Ethan had been acting strange for a few weeks, talking about seeing things in the woods near their house. Creatures, he said. She thought he was just being a kid with an overactive imagination. I asked to see his room, hoping to find some clues. Ethan's room was typical teenage stuff. Posters of bands, a messy bed, and clothes everywhere. But one thing stood out, his journal left open on his desk. Flipping through it, I saw pages filled with sketches of bizarre, animalistic creatures and detailed descriptions of his encounters with them. There were dates, times, and even locations. One entry caught my eye. The beast with three horns appears near the old mill at night. I took the journal and headed to the old mill. It was a decrepit building on the outskirts of town, surrounded by dense forest. The place had a history once a bustling hub during the town's heyday, now just a relic of the past. As I walked through the overgrown path, I could feel eyes on me, the hairs on my neck standing up. I shook off the feeling and pressed on. The mill was eerily silent, the kind of silence that makes your ears ring. Inside, the place was a mess of broken machinery, rusted metal, and scattered debris. I found a spot that looked like it had been recently disturbed, Footprints in the dust leading to a staircase going down to the basement. 
I pulled out my flashlight and descended. The basement was pitch black, the air thick and musty. My flashlight beam cut through the darkness, revealing what looked like a makeshift campsite. There were sleeping bags, empty food cans, and a strange symbol drawn on the floor in what looked like chalk. As I examined the symbol, a noise made me jump. It was faint, like a whisper carried on the wind. Ethan? I called out, but there was no answer. I followed the noise deeper into the basement, my heart pounding in my chest. The whispering grew louder, more distinct, until I could make out words. Help me, it said. I rounded a corner and found a small room, the source of the whispering. Inside was Ethan, huddled in a corner, his eyes wide with fear. He looked at me, and I could see the relief wash over his face. Dane, he whispered, his voice trembling. You have to get me out of here. It's coming. Before I could ask what he meant, a loud crash echoed through the basement. The ground shook, and dust rained down from the ceiling. Ethan grabbed my arm, pulling me towards a hidden exit he had discovered. We need to go now, he urged. We made our way through a narrow tunnel that led out into the woods. The night air was cold, and the forest was alive with the sounds of nocturnal creatures. Ethan led me to a small clearing where he had set up a crude shelter. He explained that the creatures he had been seeing were real, and they had been hunting him. He had managed to escape, but knew they wouldn't stop until they had him. Just as he finished his story, we heard it, a guttural, animalistic roar that sent shivers down my spine. I turned to see a massive, hulking figure emerging from the trees. It was like nothing I had ever seen, a grotesque mix of man and beast, with three horns protruding from its head and eyes that seemed to burn with an unnatural light. We ran, crashing through the underbrush, the creature hot on our heels. Ethan led us to an old hunting cabin he had found during his time in the woods. We barricaded ourselves inside, the creature's roars echoing through the night as it tried to break in. I could hear its claws scraping against the wood, the sound of splintering timber making my heart race. Ethan and I searched the cabin for anything we could use as a weapon. We found an old shotgun and a few shells, I loaded the gun and took aim at the door, ready to fire at the first sign of the creature breaking through. We waited, the tension in the air thick enough to cut with a knife. Then, the creature stopped. The silence was deafening. We could hear it moving around the cabin, sniffing, searching for a way in. I motioned for Ethan to stay quiet, hoping it would lose interest and leave, but luck wasn't on our side. With a deafening crash, the creature burst through a window, its massive form filling the room. I fired the shotgun, the blast echoing through the cabin. The creature roared in pain, but it didn't go down. It lunged at me, its claws tearing into my arm. I screamed in pain, dropping the gun. Ethan grabbed a metal rod and swung it at the creature, hitting it square in the head. The beast stumbled, giving me a chance to grab the shotgun and fire again. This time, the creature fell its body convulsing before finally going still. We stood there, breathing heavily, staring at the lifeless form of the creature. Ethan was shaking, tears streaming down his face. I put a hand on his shoulder, trying to reassure him. It's over, I said, though I wasn't entirely sure I believed it myself. We waited until morning before making our way back to town. I called in the incident, and soon enough the area was swarming with law enforcement and curious townsfolk. They were skeptical at first, but the sight of the creature's body silenced any doubts. I knew there would be questions, investigations, and a lot of explaining to do, but for now, the immediate threat was over. As Ethan and I sat on the steps of the old mill watching the sunrise, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief. We had survived against all odds, but deep down, I knew this wasn't the end. The woods were full of secrets, and who knew what other horrors lurked out there, waiting to be discovered.
Jake, I swear this job is going to kill me one day, I said as I walked into the missing persons unit office, the words echoing off the drab gray walls. My name's Hank Sheridan, and I've been working for the MPU for over 15 years now. The cases we handle can be heart-wrenching, but someone's got to do it. Today seemed like it was going to be one of those days where nothing too extraordinary would happen. Little did I know, it would turn out to be anything but ordinary. Jake, my partner, chuckled, shaking his head as he sifted through the files on his desk. What now, Hank? Another kid lost in the park? Or maybe a runaway teenager? I plopped down in the chair across from him and threw my legs up on the desk. Actually, we got something weird today. Missing person report came in from up near the old Barrington mine. The place has been abandoned for years. Jake raised an eyebrow. Who goes up there anymore? That's the thing. It's a guy named Robert Clem. His wife reported him missing after he didn't come home last night. Said he went up there looking for something. Wouldn't tell her what. Just said it was important. We packed up our gear and headed out. The drive to Barrington Mine was a long, winding road through the dense Pennsylvania woods. The mine had been shut down decades ago after a series of accidents. It was rumored to be cursed, but I didn't believe in any of that nonsense. When we arrived, the place was exactly as I remembered it, a desolate, crumbling mess of rusted machinery and rotting timber. The air was thick with the smell of decay and damp earth. Let's get this over with, Jake muttered, pulling out his flashlight. We headed towards the main entrance of the mine, which was partially collapsed. We had to crawl through a narrow opening to get inside. The darkness was oppressive, swallowing our flashlight beams as we moved deeper into the mine. The air grew colder, and the sound of dripping water echoed through the tunnels. Robert! I called out, my voice bouncing off the walls. Robert Clem, are you in here? We pressed on, and soon enough we came across a backpack lying in the middle of the tunnel. It was covered in dirt and looked like it had been there for a while. Jake picked it up and examined it. This must be his. Looks like he didn't get too far. We continued our search, the sense of unease growing with each step. Suddenly, we heard a noise. A faint scraping sound like something being dragged across the ground. Did you hear that? Jake whispered, his face pale in the flashlight's glow. Yeah, stay close, I replied, gripping my flashlight tighter. We followed the sound which led us to a large cavern. The ceiling had partially collapsed, allowing a sliver of light to filter in from above. In the center of the cavern, we found Robert Clem. He was lying on the ground, his body twisted at an unnatural angle. There was a large, gaping wound on his chest, and his eyes were wide open, staring at nothing. Jesus, Jake whispered, kneeling down to check for a pulse. He's dead. I scanned the cavern, trying to make sense of what had happened. That's when I saw it. A set of tracks leading deeper into the mine. They were unlike anything I'd ever seen before, almost like a combination of human and animal footprints. Jake, look at this, I said, pointing to the tracks. What do you make of it? He stood up, his face grim. I don't know, Hank. But whatever it is, it's still in here. We followed the tracks, our senses on high alert. The deeper we went, the more the mine seemed to come alive with strange noises and shadows that danced just out of sight. As we rounded a corner, we found another body. This time it was a young woman, her face frozen in a mask of terror. Her body was covered in deep gashes, and it was clear she had fought for her life. Who the hell is she? Jake asked, his voice shaking. I don't know, but we need to find out what's going on here, I replied, my mind racing. Call it in, and let's get some backup. Jake reached for his radio, but before he could make the call, the lights went out. Our flashlights flickered and died, plunging us into complete darkness. Psst, Hank, you still there? Jake's voice was barely a whisper. Yeah. I'm here, I replied, straining to see anything in the blackness. Stay close. We fumbled our way through the tunnel, using the walls to guide us. 
The sounds around us grew louder, the scraping, the dragging, and now a low, guttural noise that sent chills down my spine. Suddenly, something grabbed my leg. I kicked out, trying to free myself, but the grip was strong. Jake yelped as something yanked him into the darkness. Jake, I shouted, reaching out to grab him, but he was gone. I stumbled forward, desperate to find my partner. The tunnel seemed to stretch on forever, the sounds growing louder and more menacing. Then I saw it, a pair of eyes glowing in the darkness. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. The creature was unlike anything I'd ever seen. A grotesque mix of human and animal features with long, sharp claws and teeth that glistened in the faint light. It lunged at me and I barely managed to dodge its attack. I scrambled to my feet and ran, the creature hot on my heels. The tunnel twisted and turned, and I knew I was getting lost. Finally, I saw a faint light up ahead. I sprinted towards it, praying it was the way out. I burst into another cavern, this one filled with old mining equipment and a shaft leading up to the surface. I didn't have time to think. I grabbed a rusty ladder and started to climb. The creature screeched behind me, its claws scraping against the metal. I climbed faster, my muscles burning with effort. I could see the light growing brighter, and I knew I was almost there. I reached the top and pulled myself out, collapsing on the ground. The creature let out one final enraged scream before disappearing back into the mine. I lay there, gasping for breath, my mind racing. I had to get help. I had to find Jake. I stumbled to my feet and made my way back to the car. I radioed for backup and waited my heart pounding in my chest. When the others arrived, we went back into the mine, but there was no sign of the creature. We found Jake's body, along with several others, all mutilated in the same horrific way. The mine was sealed off, and the official report blamed the deaths on a wild animal attack. But I knew the truth. There was something in that mine, something that shouldn't exist. As I drove home, I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there, waiting. The day started like any other in the missing persons unit, tucked away in an unremarkable corner of Chicago. My name's Jareth Nolan, and I'm no stranger to the strange and unsettling. But what unfolded that day, I could never have anticipated. The office was abuzz with the usual chaos, phones ringing, hushed conversations, and the steady clatter of keyboards. I had just settled at my desk, sipping the usual bitter coffee that tasted more like burnt rubber than anything else. The morning's light slanted through the blinds, casting long shadows that seemed to creep across the floor. Hey, Jareth, got a new one for you, called out Rosa, our receptionist. She tossed a file onto my desk, her brow furrowed in that way that signaled something out of the ordinary. Great, what's the story? I asked, flipping open the file. Guy named Thaddeus Wicklow went missing two nights ago, last seen near the old freight yards. I felt a flicker of interest. The freight yards were notorious. Not just for the usual crime, but for an unsettling number of disappearances over the years. It was like the place had its own dark secrets, ready to swallow anyone who got too close. All right, I'll head over there, I said grabbing my coat. The air outside was crisp, the kind that bites at your skin and makes you wish for a warmer jacket. I drove through the congested streets, my mind wandering over the details Rosa had given me. Thaddeus Wicklow. No family, a loner, but no criminal record. Just a regular guy, or so it seemed. The freight yards were a desolate maze of rusting metal and decaying wood a relic from a time when the area was bustling with activity. Now, it was a ghost town, the perfect place for someone to vanish without a trace. I parked my car and stepped out, the eerie silence enveloping me immediately. The first thing that struck me was the absence of the usual city sounds. It was as if this part of the city had been cut off from the rest of the world. I walked through the gates, the gravel crunching under my boots, each step echoing in the stillness. I had my flashlight and a map of the yards, but as I ventured deeper, I realized just how vast and labyrinthine the place was. 
the old train cars loomed like silent sentinels, and the abandoned warehouses stood like grim monuments to a bygone era. It wasn't long before I felt the prickling sensation of being watched. Get a grip, Nolan, I muttered to myself. I had seen enough weird cases to know not to let my imagination run wild. But there was something about this place, a malevolence that seemed to seep from the very ground. I was about to turn back when I spotted something unusual, a series of tracks in the dirt leading away from the main path. They were large, much larger than any human footprint, and deep, as if something heavy had passed through. Curiosity peaked. I followed the tracks, my flashlight cutting through the growing darkness. The further I went, the more the air seemed to thicken, carrying an almost tangible sense of dread. I rounded a corner, and that's when I saw it. A massive, hulking figure crouched over something. It was like nothing I had ever seen. A grotesque amalgamation of flesh and bone covered in matted fur. Its head snapped up as the beam of my flashlight hit it, revealing a maw filled with jagged teeth and eyes that seemed to bore into my soul. I froze, every instinct screaming at me to run, but my legs wouldn't obey. The creature let out a guttural sound, half growl, half roar, and lunged toward me. I barely had time to react, diving to the side as it swiped at where I had been standing moments before. Scrambling to my feet, I ran, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I could hear it behind me, its heavy footsteps shaking the ground. I darted into an old warehouse, slamming the door shut behind me. My heart pounded in my chest as I scanned the room for anything I could use as a weapon. There was a rusted pipe on the floor. I grabbed it, the cold metal reassuring in my hands. The door creaked, then burst open as the creature barreled through. I swung the pipe with all my strength, connecting with its head. It staggered but didn't go down, turning its furious gaze toward me. Desperation took over. I swung again and again, each blow landing with a sickening thud. Finally, the creature let out a final agonized howl and collapsed. I stood over it panting, every muscle in my body trembling from the exertion and fear. When it was over, I called the precinct, my voice shaky but firm. They needed to see this, to understand what we were dealing with. As I waited for backup, I looked down at the creature trying to make sense of what it was and how it had come to be in the middle of Chicago. Hours later, the area was swarming with cops and forensic teams. They bagged the creature and I gave my statement sticking to the facts. There was no need for embellishment. What had happened was unbelievable enough. As the cleanup began, I slipped away, needing to clear my head. I drove back to the office, the city lights blurring past. Back at my desk, I sat in silence, the events replaying in my mind. No reflections, no nightmares, just the stark reality of what I had faced. In the end, it was just another case closed. Another day in the life of a missing persons investigator. It was a sunny morning when I drove up to the small town of Dustin, Illinois. The town was tiny, with one main road flanked by a couple of stores, a diner, and a few other small businesses. You could see the grain silos in the distance, a reminder that agriculture was the lifeblood of this place. I'd been sent there by the Missing Persons Unit, an agency focused exclusively on missing people. My name is Daniel Falk, and I'd been with the MPU for about six years. The work had its ups and downs, but it always kept me on my toes. I parked my car in front of the sheriff's office, a modest brick building with a wooden sign swinging gently in the breeze. Inside, Sheriff Colton sat behind a desk cluttered with paperwork, a coffee mug, and an old revolver. He looked up as I entered, his weathered face breaking into a smile. Daniel, good to see you again, he said, standing up and extending a hand. It's been a while. Yeah, too long, I replied, shaking his hand firmly. Wish it were under better circumstances. Colton nodded, his smile fading. I got your call about the missing people. It's been happening for about a month now. Folks just up and vanish without a trace. It's got everyone spooked. I pulled out a notebook and pen, ready to jot down details. How many are we talking about? 
Six so far, he said, rubbing his temples. Last one was three days ago, a young woman named Bethany Hargrove. She was out jogging and never came back. I took a deep breath. Any witnesses? Security footage? Anything? Colton shook his head. Nothing. It's like they just disappeared into thin air. We spent the next hour going over the files, each one as baffling as the next. The victims varied in age, gender, and occupation. No common thread tied them together, other than the fact they were all from Dustin. I left the sheriff's office with a stack of files and a growing sense of unease. I decided to start with the latest victim, Bethany Hargrove. Her house was a modest two-story affair on the edge of town. I knocked on the door, and it was answered by a middle-aged woman with red-rimmed eyes. Mrs. Hargrove? I asked gently. Yes, she replied, her voice barely above a whisper. My name is Daniel Falk. I'm with the missing persons unit. I'd like to ask you a few questions about your daughter. She nodded and invited me in. The house was neat, but there was a palpable sadness in the air. We sat in the living room and I began my questions. Did Bethany mention anything unusual before she disappeared? Anyone she was worried about? Mrs. Hargrove shook her head. No, she was happy. She had just gotten a promotion at work. She loved running in the mornings. It was her time to unwind. Did she ever talk about feeling watched or followed? A flicker of fear crossed her face. No, but now that you mention it, she did say she felt like someone was following her during her runs. I thought it was just her imagination. I scribbled down the note. Did she have a regular route? Yes. She usually ran through the woods on the outskirts of town. She liked the solitude. I thanked Mrs. Hargrove and left, my mind buzzing with possibilities. The woods seemed like a good place to start. As I drove to the edge of town, I couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister was lurking just beneath the surface of this quiet community. The woods were dense and foreboding, a stark contrast to the open field surrounding Dustin. I parked my car and followed the trail Bethany was known to run. The path wound through thick underbrush, and I had to duck under low-hanging branches as I made my way deeper into the forest. The air grew cooler, and the sounds of the town faded away, replaced by the rustle of leaves and the occasional bird call. I reached a small clearing and stopped to catch my breath. That's when I noticed something odd. A series of deep, claw-like marks on a tree trunk, as if something had scraped it violently. I took out my phone and snapped a few photos. As I examined the marks, I heard a rustling in the bushes behind me. I turned quickly, but there was nothing there. Just the wind, I told myself, though I didn't entirely believe it. I continued along the trail, my senses on high alert. After about half a mile, I found more claw marks, this time on the ground, tearing up the earth. Whatever made these marks was big and powerful. I knelt down to get a closer look, and that's when I noticed a piece of fabric caught on a thorn bush. It was a scrap of blue material, like the kind used in running shorts. My heart raced as I bagged the fabric and continued on. The trail grew narrower, the trees pressing in on either side. I could feel eyes on me, though I couldn't see anyone. It was a feeling I'd experienced only a few times in my career, and it never led to anything good. Suddenly, I stumbled upon a small, abandoned cabin. The door was ajar, hanging off one hinge. I approached cautiously my hand on the handle of the gun at my waist. The inside of the cabin was dark and musty, with broken furniture scattered about. But it was what was in the corner that caught my eye, a crude wooden trapdoor, slightly ajar. I drew my gun and approached the trapdoor, my heart pounding. With a deep breath, I yanked it open, revealing a narrow staircase leading down into darkness. I flicked on my flashlight and descended, each step creaking under my weight. The basement was a makeshift prison. Chains hung from the walls and the floor was littered with discarded clothing and personal items. I felt a surge of anger and determination. 
Whoever was responsible for this was a monster, and I was going to stop them. As I explored the basement, I found a series of journals. The entries were erratic and disturbing, detailing experiments on people. The author rambled about creating a new species, blending human and animal traits. My stomach churned as I read the gruesome details. Just then, I heard a noise from above. Footsteps. Someone was in the cabin. I quickly turned off my flashlight and pressed myself against the wall, my gun ready. The footsteps grew louder, descending the stairs. I could make out a tall figure in the dim light, moving with an animalistic grace. I waited until the figure was fully in the basement before stepping out of the shadows, my gun aimed at their head. Don't move, I shouted. The figure froze, then slowly turned. What I saw nearly made me drop my gun. The creature standing before me was a grotesque mix of human and beast. Its body was covered in matted fur, and its face was a twisted mockery of humanity, with elongated fangs and glowing eyes. Before I could react, the creature lunged at me with incredible speed. I fired, but the bullet only grazed its shoulder. It roared in pain and fury, swiping at me with razor-sharp claws. I ducked and rolled, firing again. This time I hit it in the chest. The creature stumbled back, blood oozing from the wound. It glared at me with a hatred that chilled me to the bone. With a final, animalistic snarl, it collapsed to the ground, lifeless. I stood there, panting, my gun still trained on the creature. The reality of what I had just faced began to sink in. This was no ordinary missing persons case. This was something far more sinister and dangerous. I quickly searched the rest of the basement, finding more evidence of the horrific experiments. As I emerged from the cabin, the afternoon sun felt like a stark contrast to the darkness I had just encountered. I called Sheriff Colton and reported everything, knowing that this was far from over. The authorities arrived and the cabin was cordoned off. The bodies of the missing people were found in the basement, confirming the worst fears of their families. The creature's body was taken away for examination, though I doubted they'd find any answers that made sense. As I stood outside the cabin, watching the flurry of activity, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was just the beginning. There were more creatures out there, and it was only a matter of time before they struck again. The next day I was back at the MPU office typing up my report. My mind kept drifting back to the creature, to its eyes filled with hatred and pain. This case had opened a door to a world I didn't understand, and it was a world I couldn't close. My phone buzzed with a new message. Another missing person, another town. My work was far from over. I grabbed my coat and headed out, ready to face whatever horrors lay ahead. You could say my job's a bit of a mixed bag. I'm Martin Langford, a missing persons unit agent based in the rough outskirts of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I used to think that after a few years on the job, I'd seen it all. Runaways, kidnappings, the occasional body turning up where it shouldn't. Today, though, I found myself neck deep in something that turned my world upside down. The morning started off pretty standard, I got to the office around 8 a.m., grabbed a coffee that tasted like it had been brewed in the Jurassic era, and shuffled through the new case files that had landed on my desk. One file in particular caught my eye. It was the disappearance of a young woman named Rachel Devine, age 23, missing for three days. What stood out was the location of her last known sighting, an old, abandoned steel mill on the edge of town long since deserted and rumored to be haunted by those who loved a good ghost story. My partner, Ethan Galloway, a lanky guy with an ever-present five o'clock shadow, leaned over my desk. You heading out to the mill? He asked, glancing at the file in my hand. Yeah, looks like it. You up for a little adventure? I replied, knowing full well that the mill was a creepy place to be, especially in broad daylight. Ethan smirked. Oh, you know me, Marty. I'm always ready to chase some ghosts. We geared up, hopped into our unmarked SUV, and made our way to the steel mill. The drive was uneventful. 
the typical mix of run-down buildings and cracked roads that characterized this part of Pittsburgh. When we finally pulled up to the mill, it was as eerie as I'd remembered from a previous case years ago. The massive structure loomed over us, its windows shattered and walls covered in graffiti and vines. As we approached, we noticed a faint trail leading into the building. It looked like someone had been dragging something heavy. We followed the trail, stepping carefully over broken glass and rusted metal. Inside, the air was thick with dust and the smell of decay. The silence was deafening, broken only by the occasional creak of metal and the scurrying of rats. We followed the trail to a large, open area that must have been the heart of the mill. In the center was a massive, rusted machine, its purpose long forgotten. The trail ended here, and that's when we saw it, a large pool of dried blood. My heart raced as I scanned the area, looking for any signs of Rachel. Jesus, Marty, look at this, Ethan whispered, pointing to a nearby wall. Scrawled in blood were strange symbols and words that didn't make any sense. They looked almost like a combination of ancient runes and modern graffiti. It sent chills down my spine. What the hell is this? I muttered, more to myself than Ethan. Before I could react, a noise echoed through the building. It was a low, guttural sound, unlike anything I had ever heard. Ethan and I drew our guns instinctively, backing up against each other as we scanned the darkness. Then we saw it. Or rather, we saw them. Emerging from the shadows were creatures that defied logic and explanation. They moved with an unnatural grace, their bodies covered in matted fur, their limbs elongated and twisted in ways that seemed impossible. Their eyes glowed in the dim light, fixating on us with an intensity that sent waves of terror through my body. One of the creatures lunged at Ethan, who fired his weapon, the gunshots echoing through the mill. The creature let out a horrifying screech, more enraged than hurt. I fired at another, hitting it square in the chest, but it barely flinched. These things were not natural. They were not from this world. Run! I shouted to Ethan, but it was too late. One of the creatures grabbed him, sinking its teeth into his neck. Blood sprayed as Ethan screamed, the sound piercing through the chaos. I fired again, desperately trying to save him, but another creature tackled me, knocking the wind out of me. I struggled to get up, kicking and punching at the thing, but it was no use. These creatures were too strong. Just as I thought I was done for, a loud noise reverberated through the mill, like a siren. The creatures paused, their heads snapping toward the source of the sound. Then, as quickly as they had appeared, they retreated into the shadows, disappearing from sight. I crawled over to Ethan, who was barely conscious, blood pouring from his wounds. Stay with me, man, I pleaded, grabbing my radio to call for backup in an ambulance. The rest of the day was a blur. The paramedics arrived and whisked Ethan away. The police swarmed the mill, but the creatures were long gone. As I gave my statement, I could see the skepticism in their eyes. They didn't believe me. Hell, I barely believed it myself. I spent the next few hours at the hospital, waiting for news about Ethan. Eventually, a doctor came out, his face grim. He's in critical condition. We've done everything we can, but it's touch and go. I nodded, feeling a mix of helplessness and anger. Those creatures were still out there, and I had no idea what they were or how to stop them. Back at the office, I started piecing together the symbols and words we had seen at the mill. With the help of an old friend who specialized in ancient languages, we discovered that the symbols were part of a ritual, an invocation of sorts meant to summon entities from another realm. It was then that I realized Rachel Devine wasn't just missing. She had been taken as part of some dark, twisted ritual. And those creatures? They were the result. As night fell, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was far from over. I gathered my gear, knowing that I had to go back to the mill, this time prepared for whatever awaited me. With a flashlight in one hand and my gun in the other, I made my way back to the steel mill. The night air was cold, 
and the building looked even more foreboding under the moonlight. Every step echoed through the empty halls, amplifying the tension that gripped me. I reached the main area where we had encountered the creatures. The blood had been cleaned up, but the symbols remained. I studied them closely, trying to decipher their meaning. Suddenly, I heard a noise behind me. I spun around, gun raised, but there was nothing there. A low growl rumbled through the darkness, and I knew I wasn't alone. My heart pounded as I scanned the area, my flashlight casting eerie shadows on the walls. Then I saw them again, the creatures emerging from the shadows, their eyes glowing with malevolence. This time, I was ready. I fired my weapon, aiming for their heads. The creatures screeched in pain as the bullets found their marks. One by one, they fell, but more kept coming. I backed up, firing relentlessly until I found myself cornered against the rusted machine. In a moment of desperation, I remembered the symbols. If these creatures were summoned by a ritual, perhaps there was a way to send them back. I pulled out the notes I had made and began chanting the words aloud, my voice shaking with fear and determination. The creatures hesitated, their advance slowing as the air around us seemed to vibrate with an unseen force. I continued chanting, louder and more confident, as a strange light began to emanate from the symbols on the wall. With a final guttural scream, the creatures lunged at me, but just before they reached me, the light intensified, enveloping them in a blinding glow. I shielded my eyes as the creatures were sucked into the light, their screams echoing through the mill until they were gone. The light faded, and silence returned. I stood there, panting and trembling, my gun still raised. It was over. The creatures were gone, and Rachel's body lay in front of me, lifeless but finally at peace. I called for backup and an ambulance, knowing there would be questions, questions I might not have answers for. As the police and paramedics arrived, I recounted what had happened, leaving out the more unbelievable details. They took Rachel's body away, and I drove back to the hospital to check on Ethan. The doctor met me in the hallway, his expression somber. He's stable, but it's going to be a long road to recovery. I nodded, relieved but still haunted by what I had witnessed. The creatures, the ritual, the light, it all seemed like a nightmare. But it was real. And I knew that somewhere out there, others like Rachel were in danger. I returned to my office, exhausted and battered, but determined. I started a new file, one that would document everything I had learned. This was just the beginning, and I had a feeling there were more cases like Rachel's waiting to be uncovered. For now, I had done what I could. I leaned back in my chair, staring at the ceiling, trying to process everything. The world was a darker place than I had ever imagined, but I was ready to face it head on. As I sat there, the phone rang. Another case, another missing person. I grabbed my jacket and headed out, ready to continue the fight. I never thought my day would take such a turn. Working at the missing persons unit, I've seen my share of strange cases, but nothing prepared me for what unfolded. It started as a regular morning in our small office in Sedona, Arizona. The sun blazed outside, the air already warm despite the early hour. I sipped my coffee, reading through reports, half listening to my colleagues chatter about their weekends. I'm Franklin Riker, a seasoned investigator with a knack for finding people who don't want to be found. Years on the job have taught me that the desert hides many secrets, but this case was about to reveal something beyond my wildest imaginings. The file landed on my desk with a dull thud. Lacey Bennett, a local hiker, had gone missing in the vast expanse of Red Rock State Park. The park's towering sandstone formations and labyrinthine trails were a magnet for adventurers and, occasionally, for those who disappeared without a trace. Lacey's mother, an elderly woman with kind eyes shadowed by worry, had filed the report. She never goes off the grid like this, 
she said, her voice trembling. Something's wrong. I glanced at the last known coordinates from Lacey's phone and grabbed my gear. My partner, Tim Carter, joined me. Tim's a good guy. Sharp, dependable, and unflinchingly brave. Ready for another hike? He asked, shouldering his backpack. We drove out to the park, the red rocks looming like ancient sentinels. The sky was a deep blue, the kind that seems infinite. As we reached the trailhead, a park ranger approached us. Her name was Maggie, and her face was a mask of concern. We've had three people go missing here in the past month, she said. Lacey's the fourth. There's something off about this place lately. We trekked along the dusty path, our boots crunching on gravel. The heat pressed down, and sweat trickled down my back. Birds chirped in the sparse trees, and lizards skittered across the rocks. The serenity was deceptive. I felt an undercurrent of unease. After hours of hiking, we reached the spot where Lacey's phone last pinged. There was no sign of a struggle. No footprints. Nothing. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. Tim scoured the area while I checked the perimeter. Maggie mentioned other disappearances, I said, scanning the horizon. Think there's a connection? Could be, Tim replied. But this place is massive. People get lost. We pressed on, the landscape growing more rugged. As dusk approached, we set up camp near a rocky outcrop. The silence of the desert night was punctuated by the occasional rustle of a nocturnal creature. The stars blazed overhead, a reminder of our insignificance in the grand scheme of things. The next morning, we resumed our search. Hours passed with no sign of Lacey. Frustration gnawed at me, but I pushed it aside. We had to find her. Around midday, we stumbled upon something strange, a cave hidden behind a thicket of thorny bushes. It wasn't on any map, and the entrance was barely visible. This could be it, I said, heart pounding. We squeezed through the narrow opening, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. The air inside was cool and damp, a stark contrast to the searing heat outside. As we ventured deeper, the passage widened into a cavernous chamber. My light flickered across the walls, revealing ancient petroglyphs. They depicted strange, beastly figures, unlike anything I'd seen before. Tim pointed to a dark corner. Look at that. I followed his gaze and froze. There, partially obscured by rocks, was a pile of bones. Human bones. My mind raced. How long had they been here? Who were they? A low growl echoed through the cave and my blood ran cold. Tim and I spun around, our flashlights trembling. Out of the shadows emerged a creature unlike any I'd ever seen. It was massive, with matted fur and limbs that seemed both animalistic and disturbingly human. Its eyes glowed faintly in the dim light, and its mouth was lined with jagged teeth. We backed away slowly, trying not to provoke it. What the hell is that? Tim whispered, fear evident in his voice. I don't know, I replied, my mind scrambling for answers. But we need to get out of here. Now. The creature snarled and lunged, but we were already moving. We bolted back through the tunnel, the beast hot on our heels. The cave echoed with our frantic footsteps and the creature's guttural sounds. We burst out into the blinding daylight, the creature stopping just short of the entrance. It seemed repelled by the sunlight, retreating into the shadows with a final, menacing glare. Gasping for breath, we didn't stop running until we reached the ranger station. Maggie looked up in surprise as we barreled in, our faces pale and streaked with dirt. We found something, I panted. A cave, bones, and a creature. Lacey might still be alive in there. Her eyes widened, and she grabbed her radio. I'll call for backup. Within hours, a team of rangers and law enforcement descended on the park. Armed and wary, we led them back to the cave. But as we approached, an eerie silence fell over the group. The cave entrance was now sealed, as if it had never existed. Are you sure this is the place? A deputy asked, skepticism in his tone. Yes, I insisted. It was right here. 
The others exchanged doubtful glances, but Tim backed me up. We both saw it. The cave, the bones, the creature. The search continued, but the cave remained elusive. It was as if the desert had swallowed it whole, hiding its secrets once more. Days passed, and despite our efforts, Lacey was never found. Her disappearance, along with the others, remained a haunting mystery. The park was closed indefinitely, and rumors of the creature spread like wildfire. Back at the office, the case files on the missing persons sat on my desk, a grim reminder of our failure. I couldn't shake the feeling that we had been on the brink of uncovering something extraordinary, something that defied explanation. Weeks turned into months, but the memory of that creature never faded. I continued my work, driven by the need to find answers, to bring closure to the families left in the dark. One day, while going through old records, I stumbled upon a document from the early 1900s. It described a series of disappearances in the same area, along with accounts of a demon dwelling in the caves. The descriptions matched what we had seen. I knew then that the creature was real, that the cave existed somewhere out there, waiting to be found again. And I vowed to keep searching, to uncover the truth hidden beneath the sands of time.